that China is powerful and insecure. As the feature of rampant misconceptions. India and China cannot go to war. That informal summits has its own limitations. Hello and welcome to the India-China Scholars Dialogue. Today my guest is Dr. Avinash Godbole. Dr. Godbole is a professor of international relations at Jindal Global University. Previously, he was a researcher with Indian Council for World Affairs and also at Institute for Defense Services and Analysis. His research is on domestic politics in China, China's Asia strategy and India-China relations. He has been involved in various track to events between India and China. He has be also been a visiting professor at Naval War College in Goa. Welcome to the Scholars Dialogue, Dr. Godbole. Thank you. Uh, in this dialogue series, we are trying to assess the contours of India-China relations over the years and its future. So let me start with a very basic questions. India and China have centuries old relationship and exchanges through religion, culture, business and they have mutual respect for each other. Then 1962 happened and they were cold to each other till Rajiv Gandhi visited in 1988. Post-93 and more so after 2000, the engagement and exchanges increased. But somehow there is no stability in this relationship. There has always been ups and downs. Border dispute is one of the major issues between two countries, but it was always there. Then why things are becoming more serious now? So apart from border, are there something more to it? Basically, when countries discussed uh, or engaged as uh, India and China in the past, there were two different uh, things. In the past, when India and China interacted, uh, two different things uh, were there. First, there was a presence of Tibet as an independent autonomous entity uh, that acted really as a buffer state. And this idea uh, that keeps coming up every now and then should not be ignored that Tibet status as a buffer state uh, and as a place that facilitated India-China interaction besides uh, the sea trade through Kolkata and uh, Hong Kong and other places, uh, that should not be ignored. And uh, countries act very differently when they act as civilizations and when they imagine themselves as powers. Civilizations are more open-minded, uh, more uh, adaptable to exchanges of ideas, learning from each other's, but powers and uh, nations and nationalisms are proud. Uh, and this pride and this hubris that comes with nationalism is perhaps something that hinders a good uh, positive exchange. Uh, China, uh, I have said this uh, for a while, and that is also something that we keep discussing uh, over a long period of time, that China is powerful and insecure. That is a thing it has come to in the last 10 years. China's power is increasing, but China's status in the international system is not changing. And China is very really a proud country. Uh, the way Chinese nationalism is shaped in the past 25 odd years, pride and civilization and having defeated the Japanese and the century of humiliation, all those discourses have made a Chinese state a very proud state. And that's what also makes their own negotiating strategy difficult. So you are seeing this in uh, South China Sea. You are seeing this in the uh, in the East China Sea with Japan. How they treat South Korea on the third missile defense system. There was that incident of a Chinese uh, cruise ship going to South Korea, but they did not get off because they suddenly got angry. Uh, now, 450 people do not get angry suddenly unless they are told by someone else to display their anger in that manner. So it was a power projection move that if we don't buy your things, no one will buy. So such pride uh, has come into the Chinese governance system and they want their power to be recognized as a status and they don't know how to make that transition from a powerful country to a country that is loved and trusted because of their model. Just the way uh, we imitate American model in our lives uh, and in our uh, consumption, in our education system, etc. Uh, Chinese want uh, that kind of status and they don't know how to get it, uh, how to get there. But why they do not know how to get there? They have seen other countries and they have done uh, themselves to a certain extent. How will you say that they do not know how to get there? They do not know in the sense uh, they uh, they are anxious. They are anxious that 
the status uh, should be recognized by other countries and other than smaller countries who are not getting help from the west or from uh, countries like india uh, people are uh, they are no one is recognizing china status uh, let me just ask you here uh, you said that china is anxious because its status is not being recognized is it because in the last four decades even if china developed so much but mostly they remain domestic oriented and did not showcase their achievements internationally till very recently so the world in general does not know about real china or there has been so much of negative propaganda against china especially by the west that they find it difficult to counter it well all the powers have gone through that uh, steps these steps so if you talk of one example of uh, the pollution in china uh, great cities in us also had their phase of pollution in uh, 1960s and 70s the london smog that killed uh, hundreds of people uh, in the 19th century and again in 1952 53 was a similar example uh, but china has other issues china image will continue to be sullied because they are non democratic because the way they treat uh, uh, his holiness dalai lama and is only starting to take uh, notice of these issues and politicizing those so it's a combination of the western propaganda on one hand uh, with with regard to a new challenger in the international system mm-hmm. everywhere yes i mean ash we read a lot about uh, minorities and human rights in china china bribing politicians and exploiting resources of other countries we do not know how much is truth to it or how much is propaganda in it but the same very countries who come up with these issues they have centuries of histories of slavery human right abuses exploitation of other countries resources uh, look at the usa uh, its treatment to its uh, blacks and and hispanics its role in middle east they have destroyed countries altogether so my question is that do we judge china differently than other western powers on the same issue just because it is not democracy in a conventional sense well see the previous rise and fall of great powers did not happen in the age of information the present uh, rise and fall and transition is happening in the age of information and uh, photography and better documentation facilities etc just two days ago that france had written off the historic debt in uh, one of the african countries where they were colonizers and they are carrying that debt demand for a long time but they wrote this off germany has apologized and agreed to repay uh, i think it was uh, nigeria uh, uh, and ghana to these countries for the historic uh, blunders uh, china's uh, rise is happening in the age of uh, information technology and uh, that's why we are understanding these issues faster i would never make this argument uh, that two wrongs would make one uh, right the american violations are wrong on their part the chinese violations are also wrong now but uh, chinese state is not as uh, not a negotiating state it's it, it's a state that deals with a hard hand uh, on uh, on these issues uh, so uh, those are the kind of things people are imagining china is still not the greatest power in the world it's still the us china is still number 2 people are beginning to fear uh, what will the repercussions if china becomes number 1 power and that is not uh, and that is why the world is reacting in the way it is reacting because uh, democracy is precious we are seeing what is being done to democracy in india and its consequences uh, by a party that thinks uh, of itself as a god and nothing less uh, can you imagine what would happen if uh, the chinese model gets popular uh, so that's that's the thing uh, but avinash if you look at the contemporary leadership it has become very ideological individualistic or nationalist whether it was mr trump or it is um, erdogan or putin or duterte or mr modi mr xi they are all strong leaders and act in a similar manner so whether you are elected or nominated by the party the style of functions remain the same yeah it it has been the era of uh, leaders above the systems and leaders above the procedures that kind of thing uh, that's why government uh, did those chennai summit and uh, the wuhan summit and things like that where which was uh, 
just for the sake of camera ops and photo opportunities, not outcome driven events. Well, about Wuhan and Mahamalipuram, two very popular and strong leaders with all authorities with them, they could have achieved anything without being questioned. Then why these summits failed? Because it was uh, short term and because it was uh, understood that uh, uh, it was a step to understand that India-China relations have got into a cyclical mode. So one good thing happens and then two bad things happen. Uh, so how to get out of that cyclical mode? And we thought that, uh, see that's what happens. The leadership uh, is more powerful and we think that the leaders will do everything. No joint statements and no procedures. So too much uh, pressure was put on the leadership also, or the leadership of both the countries assume for themselves that they can do what the process had failed to do in the last 70 odd years. And uh, it was alarm bell what happened in the uh, Doklam crisis. Uh, it was a new law. Uh, so the leadership thought that let's uh, meet and let's discuss these things, but they should have taken one step forward they should have issued some kind of guidelines that or some benchmarks. Let's focus on this short-term targets, three months, six months, one year. So easiest, slightly difficult and slightly more difficult. How do you see uh, India's relationship with China? Are they friends, competitors, cooperators, adversaries, enemies? I mean, what are they? And how important is China to India? It's a complex answer, actually. Everything of that uh, is true. Competition, uh, cooperation, uh, that was a framework uh, five years ago. But uh, after what happened last year in June, uh, that uh, cooperation will take some time to come back. Uh, it's, it's difficult to convince that uh, people that after uh, our soldiers and their soldiers died in uh, even uh, militarily unethical manner uh, of barbed wires and sticks and stones pelted on people's heads and people dying of uh, falling in frozen rivers. Uh, it's difficult to establish uh, trust or military commanders at both sides uh, need to step back and uh, or sit down and see where it went wrong procedurally and look at things from a different perspective perhaps. Uh, in fact, even that looks difficult because we had enough procedures. We had even the uh, procedure on how to handle the face-to-face -face situations. Uh, we had a procedure on how to handle situations where the two parties come together, uh, come face-to-face -face or within uh, two kilometers of one another. You know, all those guidelines and uh, which were issued in 2009 and 2013 after specific incidents. Uh, but what happens when uh, there's an incursion and uh, permanent structures created on your side of the LSE? So uh, China definitely started the escalation last year. I have no doubt in my mind. As far as I know, they were have supposed to have removed the tent after the procedural agreement of the 16th of June and 9th of June last year, which they did not do, which is what led to the escalation uh, later on. They even did not withdraw. Uh, from their post. So eight Indian soldiers were facing 300 uh, Chinese soldiers uh, because they had uh, trucks and transports within one kilometer of the, uh, or within two kilometers of the spot where the... But you know, skirmishes at the border were always there. Why it became so serious this time? Is that China has become more ambitious and aggressive or is it due to other issues uh, such as removal of Article 370, change in the status of Ladakh, or due to our closeness to the USA. What is it? Previously, there were no uh, skirmishes. Previously, there were incidents. And uh, to my memory and to my knowledge, there were only four or five hand-to-hand uh, -hand fights. Uh, and those hand-to-hand -hand fights also started in 2013. To my knowledge, uh, I may be wrong, but before 2013, uh, to my knowledge, there were no skirm, uh, brawls. So, uh, incident is where uh, both the patrolling units come face to face uh, and then they withdraw. And that is a time when the uh, ministries register protest that your army unit came uh, inside our uh, territory and uh, we ha held a flag. So, there was supposed to be a red flag and guns were supposed to be pointed down, uh, etc. So, those were treated as incidents. 
and they used to happen every week literally in each sector so there were every week there used to be literally two or three incidents of that nature uh, going by the data that was revealed by rajnath singh and others so why it was not followed this time uh, because it was a structural change uh, china was creating permanent uh, structures tents inside the indian territory uh, so you mean to say it was just a boundary issue uh, nothing else like uh, 370 or pakistan or or, or uh, our closeness to usa why it what happened incidents brawls and actual fight these are different categories of things so it's not as if india china had brawls on the border in the past mm. those uh, hand fights and fist fights uh, limited to five or 10 soldiers and then 50 at some point in 2016 that video came out and the itbp reported certain incidents in 2015 uh, so there was a gradual escalation and all of those have happened under the leadership of xi jinping mm. again a uh, proud leadership makes compromise uh, difficult i mean so it happened even before narendra modi got uh, elected in india mm. uh, those escalations on border uh, Uh, and border incidents are have been reported since 2012 13 gradually right increasing there was also the incident uh, in 2010 of china uh, denying a visa to the northern army commander of indian army mm. uh, because they're saying jammu and kashmir is a disputed territory uh, and then they said when india resisted that we will withdraw from um, uh, other meetings and nobody will go if he doesn't go then that issue was resolved so China sees itself as a great power after 2010. Uh, there were three background incidents to that. Uh, one was the global economic slowdown in the U.S. I mean, started in the U.S. the subprime crisis. So the projection that China will cross the U.S. in 2040 was lowered to 2030, and now they're saying 2026, Chinese or 2027, Chinese GDP will cross uh, American. And the second was the Olympics. Uh, which was a major event in china went hassle free in the end uh, etc the third was china surpassed japan as the second largest economy in 2010 so all these three are the drivers of chinese power and then their self perception as a as a powerful country so do you mean to say that china's foreign policy or modicom of engaging with the world has changed after 2008 Uh, and are uh, mostly after uh, post uh, uh, xi jinping's uh, appointment as a president yeah so gradually that you saw that in the white papers defense white paper in the in the foreign policy conclaves of the party that happens every uh, couple of years this gradual change from seeking uh, participation from seeking a role to deciding issues so 2010 uh, or 11 was the first time was when china gave a formula on how to resolve the israel palestine crisis until then they were talking like us like we do all parties must resolve the issues amicably you know that's a standard line of indian foreign policy so china has to talk uh, like that uh, only uh, recently they have offered to host uh, afghan government and taliban uh, for a mutual talk exactly so it's a process their own confidence is increasing and their own self perception as a power is incre- uh, increasing and all that so it's a process and that began in 2010 how does it affect india uh, it affects so they have still considered india as a as a neighboring country so chinese foreign policy uh, document uh, listed the countries according to classes the great powers neighboring neighborhood policy and then the third as the rest of the uh, world great powers and middle powers neighborhood countries and rest of the world so they consider india not as a re- regional power also yet but as a neighboring uh, middle power uh, that they have to uh, deal with and i remember one st- sentence that the chinese have made uh, a chinese ambassador made in a public event in delhi i don't know if you attended that event but i don't even remember uh, but it was definitely in uh, between 2007 uh, and 2010 or around that time that a distant friend is more important uh, is less important than a immediate neighbor yeah so that was kind of a warning to india after the india us nuclear deal yeah uh, that was a india us nuclear deal was a time when uh, i think china started perceiving that india is joining the us uh, alliance 
but that was not the case india was not joining the so they saw that from a hyper realist perspective uh, india us nuclear uh, deal came from a very different understanding to our minds we still continue to use the strategic autonomy language uh, until i think a year ago when we escalated the level of quad to a higher level so chinese misread the india us nuclear deal uh, chinese misread the uh, manmohan singh obama uh, friendship chinese misread uh, prime minister modi's gestures to the us uh, which were more uh, domestically driven which were more driven to the nri population you know the deal the howdy modi and uh, yeah. all those events it was more uh, pro- projected towards the status of the nris who Uh, so as you say that uh, chinese misread uh, manmohan singh and obama's friendship which led to nuclear deal uh, china engaged with uh, mr modi who was also very keen to cooperate with neighbors uh, they were talking to multi billion deals uh, with uh, china and invest uh, investment started uh, coming in investment did not come uh, 2014 and 2015 india and china signed close to 75 deals and we did a short follow up study on that in 2017 uh, in fact it uh, did not get published it got buried in somewhere and we hope to revive it as to what happened but there was resistance at various levels there was resistance from uh, chinese industry they wanted more land they wanted more labor to come from their own uh, side they wanted states to give a tax holiday for 20 years which the state governments did not agree in several cases like maharashtra and orissa I think Chinese intention for investment was there but maybe they were looking for same kind of policies and incentives which they offered uh, to foreign companies uh, in China which was not possible in India probably but the other thing is that maybe they were just relat- a little reluctant because they did not want to be invested in India uh, seeing that India is getting too close to uh, USA Uh, Mr Modi and Mr Trump had become very good friend and they might thought they will come up with some strategy uh, which might hurt chinese rise uh, in asia or their investment in india what do you think yeah but uh, india had always said and prime minister manmohan singh had said at least on four occasions that i remember or maybe three or four occasions that there is enough space for india and china in asia so which basically means we need to get out of this strategic uh, mistrust mindset there's a very famous speech uh, that prime minister singh gave in a party school uh, gathering in one of his visits so there he had said this line even to the esteemed uh, uh, and powerful chinese audience that there is no space enough space in asia for both india and china which which meant a lot of things which meant Uh, you could do a lot of things together you know in afghanistan in nepal in southeast asia uh, actually there was a proposal for 2 uh, plus 1 uh, india china working together uh, but uh, it did not uh, move any forward some of the things were obvious so like uh, chinese uh, uh, just before the india uh, china meeting on afghanistan uh, the chinese ambassador in afghanistan praised the the uh, praised the role of pakistan in afghanistan and india will never agree for such a proposition that pakistan is playing a responsible constructive role in afghanistan even us agrees with india's position even the europe uh, agrees with india's position that pakistan's role is inevitable but they are not playing the constructive role they are taking sides they are supporting taliban they are the ones who are hiding the leadership of uh, taliban and all that mm. so if the chinese envoy takes such a position then you know which uh, how the dialogue might be going it was a kind of a non starter uh, uh, on those issues to my mind had they worked through those disagreements they would have been uh, wonderful uh, china's posture on that publicly and uh, privately were uh, different uh, two different things so praising pakistan and isi on one hand and uh, then hoping to talk to india even after the Uh, india's memory of the 2008 blast outside the indian embassy is still uh, but at the end of the day uh, usa is also talking to pakistan they are also talking to taliban so nothing really changed but th- that is what uh, uh, usa is doing they are also praising the role of pakistan they have been issuing statements uh, very often and saying that pakistan is playing a very important role 
Yeah, but Pakistan's uh, role affects India, and if you want India on your side, now you see uh, there is a kind of a regrouping of countries happening. Uh, new friendships are uh, evolving, uh, such as uh, China, Russia, uh, Pakistan, Iran, uh, little bit of uh, Qatar. Uh, they are all coming together, and uh, while India is going on the western side. Uh, so, do you think uh, this regrouping is uh, uh, real or uh, it is just a temporary phenomenon? It's momentary, it's with the interest in Afghanistan in mind, actually. Uh, so, it will, and how it can unfold is a very uh, different question, right? Uh, no, no, not that. Uh, so, the alliance idea that you talked about was different, and the bilateral relations are different. Uh, and there are even uh, issues between Iran and Pakistan over their uh, ethnic issues and the border management. Uh, and uh, drugs and issues of that nature. So this is a momentary uh, thing. It's I don't see this as an alliance. These are multiple bilateral relations based on interest of countries. No, but it 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 uh, looks very uh, real in a sense that if you forget about politics or geopolitics, it has a very strong economic background. Uh, they are so economically linked with each other and need each other that it looks that it might convert into a real thing. Uh, uh, I still don't see it as a group thing. That is still a outcome of China's rising power, which is undeniable, actually. Mm -hmm. And as far as the Iran deal is concerned, they are uh, putting pressure on the West that we have options. And China will continue to uh, veto those resolutions in the UNSC if you give them economic opportunity. So Iran wants that also, that more resolutions will come up if the uh, back door talks fail. Uh, via Germany and Iran wants options. So Iran wants uh, some country in the UNSC which will uh, fail those resolutions and that is China. And China is starting to fail more and more resolutions uh, or veto more and more resolutions in the last 10 years, again as a part of the rising power status. Uh, and what do you think of Quad? Uh, it is a kind of a t uh, temporary phenomena or it is going to, to stay uh, longer and will become more stronger? It, it has got real. After the meeting of the uh, and the escalation uh, or the elevation, not escalation, the elevation of God that has happened in the last two years is real, and the concerns are uh, are real, and there are other countries in the region who support God, but they will not speak about God uh, publicly. Uh, I mean, you can guess uh, names. The scholars from those countries they say God is a good thing for us. We need more balancing, but. Uh, they will not uh, speak out uh, in favor of Quad right now. So, I, uh, in my mind, Singapore is one of that uh, kind. Mal Malaysia is second. They will also not speak openly in favor of Quad, uh, but bilaterally they might. Uh, South Korea likes Quad, but I mean they are too dependent on China economically now. So, Quad has to get into these issues as well, uh, getting uh, economic uh, relations in the region stronger through the Quad platform. Yeah, and then you have uh, this, this quad, uh, the four countries, uh, and then now you, you probably you are talking about quad plus, which is more countries and all. But they are so economically interlinked or dependent on China that they don't want to come openly with China. So how are they going to stay uh, together in the long run and antagonizing China? It will happen eventually in next four, three or four years. Already we have signs of India-Japan joint uh, cooperation on issues in. Uh, Southeast Asia, that is... Uh, Do you think Quad is a Asian NATO, as Chinese call it? No, it's not a NATO. Mm -hmm. Quad will never have a joint army or a shared army uh, positioning and Quad will not post... Uh, what will they do? They will continue. Uh, uh, interoperability will be the next uh, keyword actually in Quad. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's already the situation with uh, exercises like Malabar and other others. Mm -hmm. But you will see more of that. Uh, you might see more of uh, India-Japan uh, defense cooperation and training exchanges and things of that nature. How do you see Quad and vis-a-vis uh, -vis SCO and, and BRICS? Will Quad have any impact on India's uh, role in SCO and BRICS? Just like the SARC went, SARC's political uh, grouping went uh, down, but SARC's non-political uh, cooperation went stronger. So SARC agriculture... SARC environment and SARC uh, cooperation on uh, 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 on healthcare was strong in the 1990s. 
So I'm seeing a similar uh, repetition of that in the BRICS actually. Oh. Uh, on finance, on healthcare, on education, cooperation. So on certain issues they will work together, and certain issues they can be uh, they can work separately with other countries. Yeah, so it's going well uh, on education, healthcare, sports, and uh, environment and uh, clean energy. It's going quite strong actually. So my last question: How do you see India-China relations? Uh, uh, I mean, in near future, in the sense that India is asking for uh, status quo ante, which China is not willing to accept. It seems. So, how do you see India China going to to, to be uh, in near future, in immediate future, and in the short run? Uh, right now, government perception and public perception is all occupied with COVID. So, COVID-related imports from China. Uh, will increase but uh, uh, in the short term again because of covid public perception will remain negative about china mm-hmm. and that is inescapable that covid started in china and because of political structure in china it spread in the world the way they tried to suppress it in november and december of uh, 2019 so as far as bilateral relations is concerned it will take some time uh, for a normalcy to restore and once again, the violence and deaths uh, first in 40 odd years will be the is the reason for that. Yeah. I think the status quo ante is a good, is a logical, reasonable, and pragmatic demand that India is making right now. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gold Bole. It was indeed a pleasure talking to you. And I am so grateful that you came to talk while you are still recovering from COVID. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank much. you. Uh, stay safe as well.